Hello class, welcome to Criminology the Core. This is Chapter 1, Crime and Criminology. The field of criminology is an academic discipline that uses the scientific method to study the nature, extent, cause, and control of criminal behavior. It is an interdisciplinary field that actually involves several academic disciplines. As far as what criminologists do, they are responsible for criminal statistics and crime measurement. They are a field of science that creates valid and reliable measures of criminal behavior. They help to formulate techniques for collecting and analyzing official measures of criminal activities. They develop survey instruments to measure unreported criminal activity and also design methods that make it possible to investigate the causes of crime. They are also responsible for the sociology of law law and society, and socio-legal studies. They investigate the role that social forces play in shaping criminal law. They also investigate the role of criminal law in shaping society as a whole and investigate the history of legal thought. They can also suggest legal changes to help benefit society as a whole. Criminologists are responsible for developing theories of crime causation. They develop psychological, biological, and sociological perspectives that help explain criminal behavior. When it comes to explaining criminal behavior, there is victim precipitated homicide where the victim is a direct positive precipitator of the incident itself. This was, or this field of thinking was led by Marvin Wolfgang. The next person that you need to know about is Edward Sutherland. He is responsible for developing the criminology behind white collar crime. These are illegal acts that capitalize on a person's status in the marketplace, and they include theft, embezzlement, fraud, market manipulation, restraint of trade, and false advertising. The most famous of these in recent years was Bernie, uh, excuse me, Bernie Madoff. If you haven't heard of Bernie Madoff, then you absolutely need to know who Bernie Madoff is because he is considered by many to be the quintessential white collar criminal. Now, continuing with what criminologists do, they're also responsible for penology, which is punishment, sanctions, and corrections. They make efforts to control crime through the correction of offenders. They do this through rehabilitation and social control that includes mandatory sentences or even capital punishment. Then there's victimology. Victims' behavior is often a key determinant of crime. So when criminologists work with victimology, they work with victim surveys, victimization risk, victim culpability, and provide services for crime victims. This chart is in your text and it's labeled what criminologists do and it's a concept summary which is criminology in action and it basically outlines sub areas that constitute the discipline of criminology. And for instance, the sub area of criminal statistics, that means the focus of that sub area is gathering valid crime data, devising new research methods, and measuring crime patterns and trends. So 
as far as this chart is concerned, you definitely need to familiarize yourself with it and understand how criminologists work and how they do the work that they do. This is a secondary slide that further outlines what criminologists do. So the previous slide and this slide, you absolutely need to provide focus to and make sure you have a good understanding of how criminologists function. Now let's go through a brief history of criminology. There's classic criminology, which involves several people and several concepts. One prominent person was Cesar Beccaria, and his thinking was that people commit crime when the potential pleasure outweighs the threat of future punishment. He also posited that people have free will and choose to commit crime. They also perform crime when it is attractive and when it promises great benefits with little effort. He says also that crime may be controlled by the fear of punishment, especially if that punishment is swift, certain, and severe. And if it is swift, certain, and severe, it will help deter criminals. Now, there's a lot of discussion and controversy about that, but that is the thinking of the time when he lived. Now, there is positivist criminology, which is the use of the scientific method to conduct research. It helps predict and explain social phenomena in a logical manner. It requires empirical verification and the science must be value free. In other words, the science should exist for the sake of the science itself. There should be no values attached to it. Then there is sociological criminology. A famous criminologist is Emile Durkheim, and he posited that crime is normal and inevitable. He was involved in the Chicago School, which says that the influence of neighborhood conditions bears on crime rates themselves. As far as socialization views, he was able to state that linked criminal behavior is tied to the quality of an individual's socialization. It goes back to the old argument of nurture versus nature, which is an ancient argument that's been around practically since man learned to think. But he basically was saying that it was nature versus nurture and held that socialization linked criminal behavior to the quality of an individual's socialization. There is what is called conflict criminology. Karl Marx, who you've certainly heard of, described oppressive labor conditions that were prevalent during the rise of industrial capitalism. He stated that the exploitation of the working class will eventually lead to class conflict and the end of the capitalist system. He argued that there was the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. The bourgeoisie were the working public versus the proletariat who were the oppressed who were yearning to be free. He stated that human behavior is shaped by interpersonal conflict and crime is therefore a product of human conflict. And he also stated that critical criminology means that crime is a product of capitalism. Let's take a brief look at developmental criminology. 
Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck were famous criminologists who integrated sociological, psychological, and economic elements. It was a much more complex view of criminology and they stated that all of the above played a role in the incidence of crime. Now we'll take a look at contemporary criminology. This involves rational choice theory. In other words, people are able to make rational choices that were not doomed to commit crime. There's also trait theory, which states that, for example, if your father's a criminal, you are therefore doomed to be a criminal also, which we of course know is not necessarily true. There's also social structure theory, social process theories, critical criminologists, and developmental theorists. All of them play a role in the development and ongoing controversy and discussion of criminology itself. Now, this slide is a concept summary, basically of all of the things that we were just talking about. And you'll see down the left hand side, you'll see the type of perspective involving criminology. And on the right hand side, you see the forces that this perspective focuses on. So just to give you one example, we'll start at the top. In terms of type of perspective, you have the classical or choice perspective. And to the right, you see that situational forces are involved and state that crime is a function of free will and a personal choice and punishment is a deterrent to crime. So you need to become very familiar with this slide as well and make sure you have a good understanding between the different types of perspectives and the forces that each of these perspectives focus on. Now let's talk about deviant or criminal. In other words, how do criminologists define crime? Deviance includes a broad spectrum of behaviors ranging from the most socially harmful, such as rape and murder, to the relatively inoffensive, such as joining a religious cult or cross-dressing. A deviant act becomes a crime, however, when it is deemed socially harmful or dangerous. It then will be specifically defined, prohibited, and punished under the criminal law. Now, as far as becoming a deviant, Deviant acts are criminalized when they become crimes themselves. Deviant acts are decriminalized when penalties are reduced. A good example of that is that in Great Britain, homosexuality among men, not among women, but among men, used to be considered a crime. And as society moderated and as we learned homosexuality is not a choice and Great Britain eventually removed that that can that act of homosexuality that used to be considered deviant from its books and it is no longer considered a crime in Great Britain so that's a good example of how something had become deviant. It was a deviant act that was criminalized because it became considered a crime. And then when homosexuality was removed from Great Britain's laws, that deviant act became decriminalized because the penalties are reduced and actually 
there are no penalties at all anymore. Sometimes previously deviant acts are legalized and no longer considered crimes, which is essentially what I was just saying. Now, this chart you need to become familiar with also. It is the concept of crime. And as far as a concept summary in terms of the definition of crime, this means that the definition of crime affects how criminologists view the cause and control of illegal behavior and shapes their research orientation. And just to look at the very first thing, we'll look at the consensus view, which if you look on the left, it says consensus view. And on the right, it says that the law defines crime. There's agreement that exists on outlawed behavior and that the laws apply to all citizens equally. You also have the conflict view and the interactionist view. Please make sure you become familiar with this chart as well as the others that I have pointed out to you. Now, as far as a definition of crime, crime is a violation of societal rules of behavior as interpreted and expressed by the criminal law, which reflects public opinion, traditional values, and the viewpoint of people currently holding social and political power. And if you know anything about history, you know that what was considered a crime a hundred years ago is not necessarily considered a crime now. Now there are certain exceptions. Of course, murder is a crime and will always be a crime. But as far as fitting a definition, crime is not just a crime in and of itself, but it is also a reflection of society as a whole, what we accept as societal behavior and how it is interpreted and expressed by criminal law and court. Individuals who violate these rules or violate these definitions of crime are subject to sanction by state authority, social stigma, such as a uh, sex criminal and loss of status in society. Now here's a discussion question for you to consider. What are three behaviors that are deviant but not criminal and three behaviors that are criminal but not deviant? Now the second question, ask yourself, how may behaviors that you consider non-deviant be seen as deviant by someone else? Now let's take a look at criminology and the criminal law. The Code of Hammurabi was the first written criminal code. There's the Mosaic Code, which was the law of the ancient Israelites. And then there is common law, which is set by precedent, mala in se, and mala prohibitum, which are statutory crimes. There's also contemporary criminal law, which includes felony versus misdemeanor. It enforces social control, discourages revenge, helps to express public opinion, teaches moral values, deters criminal behavior, applies quote-unquote just deserves, it creates equity, and helps to maintain the social order. Then there's the evolution of criminal law. Criminal law evolves in an effort to reflect social and economic conditions.
Now, as far as criminology and criminal justice are concerned, this consists of the agencies of government that are charged with enforcing law, adjudicating crime, and correcting criminal conduct. The criminal justice system includes police and law enforcement, the court system, and the correctional system. And the process of justice includes initial contact, which would be the initial contact with police, for instance, investigation, arrest, custody, the filing of a complaint or charge, preliminary hearing or grand jury, depending on which state you live in, arraignment, bail or detention, plea bargaining, adjudication, which is the trial process, and disposition and sentencing. It also involves appeal, correctional treatment, release, and then post-release or aftercare. Let's touch on ethical issues in criminology. What to study. In other words, keep research independent and free of outside interference. Whom to study? Do not ignore middle class or white collar crime, organized crime, and government crime. Crime is crime, no matter who commits it or what level of crime it is considered to be. In terms of how to study, you want to make sure that you fully inform research subjects and maintain confidentiality. So anytime criminology is studied, research subjects are told exactly what they're going to be subjected to, what they're going to be questioned about, and they have to be confident that their confidentiality is absolutely going to be maintained. Okay, class, that does it for this chapter. Thank you so much for your time and attention. As we move through the class, you will find me saying at the end of every chapter, please make sure to contact your instructor should you have any questions or any issues that you're not clear about. Never hesitate to contact your instructor. Please make sure that you understand also that these lectures are meant to be a tool and meant to assist you with your study of the text and not meant to replace study of the text itself. Thank you as always for your time and attention and we will greet you again in chapter two with our next class.